Larry, so far, how do you evaluate the Israelis' attack on Gaza? Was it a successful military operation, in your opinion? I would say no. The ultimate success of a military operation also hinges on the politics. And the politics of this are going wrong for Israel, in my view, both domestically and internationally. Uh, on the domestic front, uh, Netanyahu came under tremendous pressure to do something about the hostages, and yet faced uh, equally strong opposition inside his own government to make a deal. And so uh, he ultimately had to succumb to that pressure to make a deal to get the hostages released because the families were growing in number in terms of their, uh, the protests in the streets, showing up outside his house and outside key government buildings. It was just bad optics uh, all along. So, uh, and uh, then on top of that, his own political reputation is probably at the lowest point in, in his entire political career. So the war is not doing a lot domestically to rehabilitate that for him. Uh, internationally, Israel is more isolated now than it has ever been in any of these previous military uh, invasions, military responses that it has engaged in in places like the, the Gaza Strip or Lebanon or the Golan Heights. So, um, they yeah, they've, they're killing a lot of uh, Palestinians. That's true. They're destroying lots of buildings in Gaza. That's true. But killing and destroying doesn't necessarily mean that you're winning. Again, the winning comes about that you're able to convince people that you know, you're you're on the right side of history, and I think what's happened to Israel in this case is they're they're coming out on the wrong side. Do you see any fracture within the political parties inside Israel? Yeah, yeah, no, they've agreed on one thing. Uh, I think across the board, regardless of how people feel about Bibi Netanyahu as prime minister. Uh, all of the, the vast majority of the Israelis want to get rid of the Palestinians. They want to exterminate the Palestinians. And you say, oh, that's, that language is harsh. Well, they want to push them out. They want to expel them. And uh, the, they are, they're fed up from their standpoint. So they're, and they're, they're wanting to get rid of the Palestinians, not just in Gaza, but in uh, the West Bank and then uh, up in southern Lebanon. Uh, the, you, you've got the, there has been a, a, an ugly consensus emerge among uh, the Israelis uh, across, you know, across the political spectrum about, uh, you know, purging Israel of all uh, Palestinian and foreign influence, make it only for Israelis, for Zionists. At the end of the day, you think these attacks would help Hamas or would weaken Hamas? Good question. I think in, in the eyes of some in the Gaza Strip, Hamas uh, is it's it's gone up in their view. But there are, there's still I can see many would be blaming Hamas for the death and destruction that's being visited upon the civilians. Um, Hamas I, ironically, I, uh, let me put it this way. Before October 7th, Hamas would not have had anything good said about it in Egypt, in Saudi Arabia, uh, or in Turkey, um, or in Jordan, for that matter. It was, it was fairly isolated. It did not have broad-based support in the Arab Muslim world. Now, they do. They, they have received more support and encouragement uh, as a result of what Israel has been doing. And I, that was my point when, in a, the earlier discussion. Israel's actions are making Hamas look better in the eyes of many or forcing them to accept Hamas or embrace Hamas in a way that, you know, uh, two months ago they never would have done. We still see some videos, some pictures from these tunnels underneath the Al Shifa Hospital. All these tunnels belong to Hamas. There is a lot no, of facility uh, down there. Yeah. What, what, well, no, what's that, that? That, that, that's all. Look, that, that, that's Israeli nonsense. They're, 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 they, they, Israel itself constructed these facilities 
back in 1983. So this was nothing built new by Hamas. It's true that Hamas has a network of tunnels throughout the Gaza Strip that uh, is being used to store weapons, to uh, hide uh, their military forces, to move personnel from one point to another, to smuggle goods. Yes, that, that's true. But what has taken place at Al-Shifa had absolutely nothing to do with that Hamas system. And Israel really embarrassed itself with its uh, lame propaganda, Hasbara. Um, I, it was really, I was surprised. You know, we talked about it, I think, last week when they, the Israelis showed up with these boxes labeled medical supplies. Well, they speak Hebrew in, in Israel. Why are they labeling boxes in English as medical supplies if they're Hebrew speaking, delivered it to a bunch of Arab speakers? Doesn't make sense. And those boxes were used to smuggle in items that were planted to look like evidence that uh, Hamas had used that uh, Al Shifa's basement as a command center. But you know, they shot they shot a video around the MRI machine, and they shot two different two, two different shots of it. And uh, in, in the first one, they only showed one AK forty seven. Then in the the subsequent one showed two AK-47s, and the packing foam that had been around the container was removed. So Israel is meddling with evidence. They were you know, trying to manufacture the story, and nobody bought it. Very few. I mean, the Israeli supporters bought it. Those who are very pro-Israel bought it. But the rest of the world just scoffed at it. So that, that's nonsense. It seems that the only country that the Netanyahu administration relies on is the U.S. And no. are they giving good advices to the Netanyahu administration? Are they helping them? How do you see this relation between these two administrations? Oh, the, Bi the Biden administration, you know, they can't make a decision. So they're trying to play both sides of the issue. On the one hand, they're saying they stand firmly with Israel, firmly with Bibi Netanyahu. Yes, we're on his side, um, and by and they've deployed military uh, assets to the naval ships to the region, sort of as a show of force, a reminder. Yes, we're backing Israel, but then as the political pressure mounted about the Israeli atrocities and the the human rights abuses that are being committed, the, then the Biden administration also began waffling, and trying to apply some pressure to Israel to back off. And, uh, you know, they've, they've met with limited success. So uh, the Biden administration, I think, is sort of stunned that they're getting a lot of domestic pushback, particularly from people under the age of 40 in the United States who are adamantly anti-Israel and pro-Palestinian. That is, uh, that's not you know, that's very atypical of what has been expected in the past. So, uh, you know, the Biden administration is, they're, they're stumbling through this crisis. They're certainly not exercising any kind of leadership. And I think that's one of the reasons you saw the Organization of Islamic Countries and the Arab League, they came together first in Saudi Arabia, then they went to China, then they went to Moscow, meetings with Xi Jinping and with Vladimir Putin. They're not going to the United States. They're sending a very clear signal that they've got more confidence that China and Russia can play a, a constructive role in bringing an end to this madness than, than anything the United States would have to offer. As you mentioned, China and Russia, I think their point of view on Israel and Gaza is of paramount importance. How do you see their opinion on Gaza? Are they talking about two-state solution, one-state solution? What's the official point of view of these two countries? Is that different from what they're talking behind the scenes or is the same? Well, the, the public position for both Russia and China is emph emphatically on the side of a two-state solution. And in fact, even the Biden administration has come out in favor of that. You know, that's one of the consequences of this October 7th attack by Hamas, that it has brought this issue to the fore. And countries that in the past may have given lip service to it 
or may not have said had anything good to say about it, are now coming forward and, and emphasizing that is, in fact, what must be done. And, and particularly among the Arab Muslim countries in the region, uh, they're all agreed that there's got to be two states and one state, which is independent Palestine, independent of Israel, with no Israeli soldiers running around arresting people uh, randomly without cause and, and locking them up. Uh, so, uh, but I, I think the, the broader interest for both Russia and China is they recognize that this could spin out of control quickly. And the, the, they have a very, I think, sincere interest in trying to contain this to within the borders of Israel and Gaza and have, do not let it spread beyond that. Because if it spreads beyond, you're looking at the potential for uh, a, a global war. Some of Muslim countries, they're accusing Saudi Arabia of being so soft on this issue. On the other side, we have the other party that talking about now Saudi Arabia is getting more rigid toward this conflict against Israel. After all, how do you see their policy in Gaza? Are they soft? Are they hard? How do you see that? The Saudis have always been pretty adept at playing a double game throughout the Middle East. Um on the one hand, perceived as this hardline, rigid, uh, almost the extreme version of Islam with the Wahhabi sect. On the other hand, dealing regularly with the United States, being uh, actually being used somewhat as a tool of the United States. Uh, that was particularly the case in the war with Yemen and the Houthi rebels, where uh, the, the Saudis are basically a proxy for the United States in that war. It was being done explicitly to create a division between Iran and Saudi Arabia. So, you know, there's I think there's some something to be said for Saudi have been pretty squishy on issues of Palestinian rights. Uh, they've not been like Qatar, where the Qatari authorities have been pretty uh, direct in supporting Hamas, at the same time that Qatar is playing host to the largest U.S. military base in the Middle East, at the al udid Air Force Base. Um, so what has happened over the last, I, I'd say, nine months is first came the reconciliation between Iran and Saudi Arabia. That was huge. Uh, that really sort of pulled the rug out from under the U.S. policy as far as trying to isolate Iran. And, you know, it really, it eased, it, it eased the tension significantly between the Saudis and the Iranians. The Saudis had always been fearful that Iran was going to stir up revolution among the oil workers in the East. And, uh, you know, so the, the, they found this, uh, you know, new diplomatic relationship uh, a source of comfort, at least, it has defused that tension. And then the Saudis have always had these pretensions to being the leader, being, you know, one of the wealthiest countries in the region, if not the wealthiest. And so they've naturally tried to take the lead. However, uh, the, the I guess, the, the political pressure, the people that the al-Sisi is in Egypt is feeling, uh, that the king of Jordan, Abdullah, is feeling, is forcing the Arab, these Arab nations and Muslim nations to become, I think, more uh, rigid in, in the, putting demands on Israel to stop the killing and to open up a genuine two-state solution dialogue. As time went by during this conflict in Gaza, do you think that they're going to keep fighting, keep bombing and devastating Gaza, or are they going to back down, they're going to slow down and find an off-ramp? It depends on who in, in Bibi Netanyahu's cabinet has the upper hand. If it's left to Defense Minister Galant and this uh, Ben Gavir, the home, uh, sort of their uh, home security the guy in charge of national security for domestic affairs, uh, they'll they'll want to bomb the Palestinians into the Stone Age. They'll want to level the place, destroy it. Uh, but I, I think there's some other economic realities intruding. Uh, Israel's economy is suffering. 
because of the war. It's you've taken 300,000 people out of the workforce and the costs of sustaining those troops in the field are adding up. So uh, it, it's a, really the time starts clicking down uh, with respect to Israel's ability to sustain itself in this conflict. It, it'll have ample number of bombs, but just blowing up buildings and killing civilians it goes back to where we started. Winning a war is an extension of politics. War, it's not a it's not a contest to measure who can stack up the most bodies, who can pile up the most rubble. It is who can defeat the enemy and uh, or defeat their ability to continue fighting. Uh, what Israel is doing is, I think, actually strengthening the resolve not only of Hamas, but of Hezbollah and other Muslims throughout the region against Israel. Uh, the, I mean, I know many Americans who, you know, formerly I would actually classify themselves as supporters of Israel, who now despise it, uh, have just uh, for what it is for what it is doing and how it is conducting itself. It is it's behaving no differently than the Nazis did when they leveled the Warsaw Ghetto. And people may say, well, that's a harsh, extreme comparison. But when the similar kinds of techniques are being used against people who are not armed, you know, the, Palest the, the Palestinians and the Hamas in particular, they're not armed with their defense systems. The, 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 their weapon systems are really pretty rudimentary. So it is uh, there's a clear advantage on Israel's side and it's, it's using its force, some would argue, indiscriminately. We all talk about casualties on the part of Palestinians. How about Israelis? What do we know about the casualties on the part of Israelis? Israel is very uh, averse to having casualties. Uh, the, the, the smallness of their country, the small size of its population relative to other countries, means that they, they're not ready to absorb uh, five, 10,000 casualties. That would be catastrophic for them. Uh, what it, Israel's taking great pains to hide the number of actual casualties that they are incurring. It appears that they are, the more are being killed than they're admitting to, but I don't think it exceeds, uh, you know, 100, 150 at this point. But that's still that is a lot from the Israeli standpoint. The They've avoided heavy casualties in part because of their tactics. They're not going in with armor and troops in a, or surrounding the armor where they could be picked off. That's why they're bombing, leveling these areas, and then uh, you know being very cautious. If you look at the maps that show what they occupy, it's it's really around the edges. They haven't penetrated into the heart of Gaza, uh, both north or south. And if they do, that's where they were likely to encounter the most stiff resistance and uh, the, and then more casualties. So uh, if, if Hamas succeeds, succeeds in inflicting a large number of casualties on Israel, Israel's uh, willingness to continue this war is going to be affected negatively. How about the morale on the part of Israelis? How do you find it so far? Yeah, I think it's holding up, but it's, uh, you know, the, the, there's there's growing dissension. The, there's a, the unity that was felt the first week after October 7th. I think that started to dissipate. Um, and uh, the growing political opposition to Bibi Netanyahu, uh, as well as questions about the war strategy, because... You know, is, Israel sees these images, too, of these uh, dead Palestinian children and babies. And that goes around the world. It doesn't matter what the context was. But then, on the other hand, you have senior Israeli officials, uh, some both current and former, saying hey, these are, you know, all these civilians, they're Hamas. Babies, they're Hamas. I mean, it's ridiculous. And it's bizarre, but that's what they're saying.
We had Lloyd Austin visiting Kiev, talking with Zelensky. What he was looking for, he was looking for convincing Zelensky to go after negotiations. He went there just to announce they're going to support Ukraine. It was one of the most bizarre visits that you could imagine at this time. Ukraine is losing territory steadily every day now as Russia continues to advance. Ukraine does not have any kind of effective air defense system in place. And the United States does not have one that it can offer them, even though it says, oh, yeah, we're going to provide air defense systems. We, we don't have it. We've already provided Patriot batteries that proved out to be ineffective. You know, expensive pieces of junk. Um, the ability of the United States to supply artillery shells. Similarly, very, very limited, especially now with the war uh, going on in Israel. Uh, the United States is going to support their needs before they'll support Ukraine. Um, and so the the tactical and strategic picture for Ukraine, it looks dire. And yet Austin is out of touch with reality. He's delusional. He keeps talking about, well, yeah, Ukraine took back all this territory from Russia, and the Russians are getting just savaged on the battleground. No, they're not. I mean, he can say, you know, he can walk out in front of a camera tomorrow and declare that he's a chocolate donut. Just because he says he's a chocolate donut doesn't make him a chocolate donut. And he's doing the same with respect to Ukraine. Uh, that, oh, yes, they've they've got a viable way forward. Just all they've got to do is just get the, the right equipment in their hands and, uh, you know, they'll, and they'll be able to, uh, uh, you know, hurt the Russians. They don't have enough soldiers. They're using women, including pregnant women on the front lines now because they don't have enough men. So this is to, to allow this to go on. If, if you were the manager of a boxer and your boxer is in the middle of the ring just getting pounded, you would call an end of the fight. You'd throw in the towel to save the life of that boxer. Uh, Austin is not doing that at all. They're encouraging the boxer, get out there, keep punching, even though you, you are the punching bag. You're the one that's getting clobbered. But we need you to do this so we can try to hurt Russia. There's... The West is so twisted in its anger towards Russia that it cannot see straight. It does not see rationally anymore. That, that's what is so disturbing because you can't, there is no opening or opportunity for any mainstream U.S. politician, Democrat or Republican, to come out and say, hey, look, you know what? We need to broker a peace between Russia and Ukraine on this. Russia is not our enemy. We have unfairly demonized Vladimir Putin and the Russian people. We need to stop it. We need to come up and find ways that we can cooperate. Because as all this is going on, the United States is still cooperating with Russia on the space station. So don't tell me that we can't find areas where we can work together. You know, that's a lie. Do you think that the Biden administration is severe enough in their attitude towards Zelensky to convince him to go after negotiations? If you look back a year ago, March, March of 2022, March 29, Ukraine and Russia had agreed a, on a peace deal. And the Biden administration were the ones who took the lead and said, no, no, we're not going to agree to that. We want Ukraine to keep fighting. And uh, Zelensky was told in visits by Boris Johnson of the UK and then by Lloyd Austin and by Bill Burns and by Anthony Blinken. No, you can't you can't surrender. So they uh, completely broke the deal they had made with Russia. And that's why they're in the state they are now. Uh, they, they had a chance for peace. They would have ha held on at the time, really, to Kherson uh, and to uh, Zaporizhia. Not now. Or there's no way in hell that Russia's going to give up Zaporizhia or Kherson. And they'll probably even take Kharkiv and uh, Odessa. And then, and then what is 
Ukraine have. They've 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 lost even more. So you know, I, I think uh, the, the Biden administration, the, yeah, the, the, they have some clout to order Zelensky about telling him what to do, but his options have now grown extremely limited compared to what they were a year and a half ago. Is Zelensky capable of convincing, of persuading these ultra-nationalists, these neo-Nazis to make a deal with Russians? Is that possible in your opinion? No, no, that's not possible at all. I think that's part of the hesitancy or the reluctance of Zelensky to do anything on that front, fearful that they'd kill him uh, so that the, the these ultra-Nazi ultra uh, right-wing nationalists would, would kill him. Uh, so it is what I, I think the next three or four weeks will actually be pretty telling in terms of the morale of the Ukrainian people, because what you're seeing take place, the winter has come early and it's come with uh, some force. You know, the temperatures are now uh, down around one, two degrees Celsius. Um, in some cases, uh, minus 10 degrees. So it is extremely cold. And it's just November. It's not even December. And you know, the power system, the heating systems won't hold up in Ukraine. They'll be looked at at that point. The, the people who have been actually, you know, life has appeared to go on normal without much sacrifice. Uh, that'll come to an end. And when they're when they start having that kind of suffering, uh, then you're going to see the, uh, the growing pressure on Zelensky to get out, to leave. Is there any difference between Zelensky and Zeluzhny when it comes to their relations with these neo-Nazis? Well, the big difference is Zelensky can play the piano with his penis, okay? We've already seen that. <laughs> but I'm not sure Zeluzhny could do that. No, they've they've been at odds on as far as the military strategy goes, which is crazy because, you know, Zelensky knows comedy. He knows... so. Uh, novel ways to play the piano, but he doesn't know military strategy. Uh, Zeluzhny does. Uh, and Zeluzhny is a graduate of military academies where he's interacted with uh, current Russian military personnel in the past. Uh, so, you know, I think the, the conflict for them, it's quieted somewhat, you know, gone out of the public's uh, arena over the last week or two, but I expect that to heat up again. Um, I... I'm still in the camp that I'll be surprised if Zelensky is still in office by the end of December, five, six weeks from now. We were talking about this shift of focus from Ukraine to Israel. Is that an excuse for the politicians in the U.S., for Republicans, for Democrats who are against this funding, this sending for more funds and weapons to Ukraine? Or it's a real issue for them? Yeah, well, it's it's a little bit of both. Um Let's say that the war had not broken out between Hamas and Israel. Then I think these members of Congress who now are saying that they don't want to support more funding for Ukraine because they want to give it to Israel, I don't think they necessarily would have been as outspoken or upfront about cutting off support for Ukraine. So the war in Israel gives them really a convenient excuse, a convenient out to say, oh, no, we can't we can't support both. We don't have the money for it. And we've got to go with our best friend, Israel, as opposed to our second best friend, Ukraine. Janet Yellen said the U.S. cannot afford Ukraine losing this war. Why they're so obsessed with Ukraine? Now everybody knows what was happening in Ukraine, what has happened in Ukraine. Why they're so obsessed with that? The United States, the, the plan was Ukraine was going to destroy Russia. It was going to create a political crisis in Russia that Putin would be forced out. And the West definitely saw ways to divide Russia up into five different countries to create something that where the West could control access to the gas, the uranium, uh, the oil, the, the nickel, the aluminum, the copper, the, uh, the fertilizer. You know, we just go down the list. Everything that Russia has that the West doesn't have that's what the West wanted. And, um, you know, they've been 
they they turned on Putin starting about 2009 2010. Uh, they basically viewed Putin as the new prison inmate, and you know the new prison inmate is the one who, uh, unless he's got the ability to fight back, is going to get raped and dominated, and be the be the bitch of the prison leaders. Well, Putin made it very clear. He says, I, I'm nobody's bitch. Russia is not going to be at the end of a leash held by Western masters. No way. And, uh, you know, began very uh, straightforwardly pursuing Russia's natural interests and national interests, even when it conflicted with that of the West. And we saw that initially in Syria where the Russia intervened to stop a Western coup against Bashar al-Assad and successfully defeated it. Uh, and now Russia is crushing the attempt of the United States and NATO to use Ukraine as a proxy force to defeat Russia. And they, and they genuinely, the West genuinely believed that uh, Ukraine would, would accomplish this. That Russia was not capable of withstanding a full-blown assault by Ukraine with the backing of NATO. Uh, another, ter you know, uh, terrible miscalculation on the part of Biden and, and NATO. In case of the new presidential election in 2024, if Trump or let's assume RFK Jr. win this election, how do you see the future of the U.S.-Russia relations? Is that going to go in a better direction is that possible to improve their relations in a short term? How do you see that? Uh, I don't know. I don't think it can improve. Not because there's a lack of will on the part of Russia. It's a lack of will on the part of the United States. I mean, right now, when Trump and RFK, when they go out and speak about running to reestablish, normalize relations with Russia, they are immediately attacked as puppets of Putin, as surrender monkeys, as, uh, as uh, communist sympathizers. I mean, all sorts of, you know, ridiculous labels are applied to them. And, and yet the media goes along with it. The media doesn't say, yeah, you know, uh, Trump and RFK, they actually, they're making a good point. You know, Russia should not be our enemy for a whole variety of reasons. You cannot have that discussion on Fox News, CNN, MSNBC, ABC, CBS, uh, none of them. You can't have that discussion. It's not permitted in the Washington Post or the New York Times. So and until that changes, and uh, the only thing I think that will potentially change that is, is once Russia crushes Ukraine, and then tries to open up a dialogue with the with the West to see if it can rekindle something. But you know, frankly, if if I'm Russia at this point, I sit down and count how much do I need the United States. And if the answer is not very much, so you know we're we're going to go our own path. We're not going to have a lot to do with the United States. We we've made our attempt. We have a Russia has a history of trying to support the United States, uh, to, going back to the Civil War, and even uh, in the American Revolution to a lesser extent. <clears throat> and America has now returned the favor by transforming Russia into this imperialist enemy that doesn't exist. This last meeting between Xi Jinping and Biden, what the Biden administration wanted to achieve by this meeting? Yeah, they got they got a, a photo op where he didn't fall asleep on the table or, you know, say something incredibly stupid. <clears throat> but th there were no substantive agreements coming out of that meeting other than to reopen contacts between the military. The uh, and, and then it was followed up with Biden at the at the uh, press conference accusing Xi of being a dictator. And then that uh, sort of add ins injury to insult, uh, they uh, end up announcing a, a multi-million dollar 
uh, or maybe it was billion, I forget how many uh, zeros were there, to Taiwan uh, for the bolster the, their military against China, which China views that as hostile as well. So, you know, the, uh, the biggest accomplishment out of the meeting, they got all the human feces off the streets of San Francisco. One of the main arguments of John Mearsheimer, every time he talks about China as a pure competitor of the U.S., when it comes to China, how realistic is that? Is that realistic to go after China to fight China? Well, I would, I would ask John, John, make me up the list of the countries that China's invaded since 1980. Be a real, 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 real short list. There wouldn't be any countries on it. China has not declared itself as the policeman of the world, unlike the United States. China has not carried out unprovoked military interventions in other countries, such as the United States. And you say, oh, well, wait a second, we were, we were provoked. The United States is always looking for an excuse to get militarily engaged, whether we're talking about Iraq twice, Afghanistan, Somalia, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Serbia, uh, in, the, in, in East and West Africa. Uh, though we've had in, uh, in, in attempts back in what, 1989 uh, in, in Panama. So, you know, the, the point of this is going back over 43 years, the United States has been the imperial aggressor around the world. And if you use Mearsheimer's logic, but you're Chinese and you're looking out, you've got to say, my God, what are we going to do to stop these Americans? They're coming after us. So those people say, oh, that's nonsense. Really? You had you had one of the senior officers with Indopaycom, the U.S. military command in charge of China, saying, yeah, we're, we'll be at war with China in two years. What? If you're the Chinese, we're not planning to go to war. They're the ones planning to go to war. So that's why I say this entire, you know, so much of our discussion of threats to the United States are tied up in identifying enemies that will then be used to justify spending. We're now going to spend $850, $900 billion on defense is to keep the defense industry going. Because if that defense industry collapses, the U.S. economy will collapse. It's all about the money. Are we going to have some sort of prudence between the U.S. and China on the issue of Taiwan? Well, I, I get it. What's the issue? The United States has already agreed with China that Taiwan is part of China. What's the issue? If, if you're trying to create an issue to say, oh, no, Taiwan must be free. OK, that's a whole new issue. That's not what we agreed on. And the United States likes to talk about international rules based order. Except is we only follow the rules as long as it favors us, as long as it serves our particular interests. You know, there doesn't need to be a negotiation between the United States and China on Taiwan. That negotiation was settled over 50 years ago when the United States agreed Taiwan is part of China. It is the one China policy. We didn't say, no, Taiwan's a separate independent country. Sorry, China. We can't have relations with you because Taiwan's separate. We never said that. And, you know, the, the, the American politicians and academics that want to argue the opposite, uh, you know, they're creating their own reality. They're ignoring the past. And, uh, you know, the, the reality, I think, in this is that ultimately Taiwan will choose to become part of China. Now, China's got, you know, it's got some significant economic uh, problems at home, you know, and it's, uh, you know, the attempts to paint China as this military uh, powerhouse. So, okay, give me one example. One example where China's military has gone out and conquered, defeated, manhandled some other country. 
the last the last time China got engaged militarily outside of its boundaries uh, of its borders was in uh, Vietnam. <coughs> excuse me, in 1979, and they got their ass handed to them. So, you know, like I said, this the 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 rhetoric in the United States is so divorced from reality. And we keep lying to ourselves about all of these issues. And, you know, that's the problem with lies. You tell the lie long enough, you start believing it. It becomes true. 